social abstract essence of labor, whom you can imagine as, again, a social, will be realized in communism. That's this purely technocratic vision there. But then, here comes, yes, here comes the Poston's wonderful result, which is that with capital and most of Grundrisse, the, the topic of Marx shifts radically. It's no longer this materialist obsession. It's, you know, I quote it all the time, you know what I mean, that uh, beginning of capital. It's no longer, the beginning is no longer real life and so on. It's commodity as a historical form. And then, as Marx put it, to penetrate from the surface, commodity is an ordinary object, to the, as Marx put it, theological niceties, metaphysical sub subtleties, and so on and so on. That is to say, the focus of Marx in Capital is not simply ideology versus reality, as I already repeated it often, it's reality, it's a commodity fetishism as ideology, theological dimension, which is found in the very heart of economic reality. It's the, which is why, again, as many people noticed, reading Marx really closely, which is why it was so difficult for Marx to classify commodity fetishism. Like, is it ideology or not? Since it's an illusion, it should have been ideology. But interestingly enough, Marx never, never, never calls commodity fetishism ideology. Because it's too much part of economic base itself. Why is this important? So that's the first thing we should do today. To rehabilitate this post-Marxist Marx. If by Marxism we understand the standard economic base and so on, Marxism. Second thing. And here, I again agree with Poston, this is what bothered me for a long time. What to do with so-called, unfortunately, labor theory of value? Marx there commits the same error of abstraction, but I think he is right there. You know what's the problem? When he says, the very first chapter of Capital, that if you look at commodities, their concrete properties account for their use value. But if you abstract from concrete properties and observe commodity as an abstract object, the only thing that remains is what all commodities have in common, which is being the products of human labor. Sorry, this appears as a clear logical mistake, because if you abstract from concrete use value, then what remains is clearly the abstract form of use value, the abstract property of being useful, in the, in the same way that if you abstract from concrete labor, the only thing that remains is abstract labor, and so on and so on. But why is Marx here right? Poston gave, gave the best explanation. Because it, this marks his basic distinction between two forms of labor. Concrete labor, which concrete work which provides <coughs> the use value of a commodity, and what Marx calls abstract labor, the source of value, that it's not really a question of abstraction. But it's a question of something totally different. In capitalism, and this is the uniqueness of capitalism, why can we get personal freedom and so on and so on? We get personal freedom because the fundamental social relations of domination are already inscribed into the structure of the production process, into la labor process itself. For Poston, his right point is that Abstract labor does not mean simply abstraction of labor. It means labor in its function, not as producing use value categories, but labor as the structuring principle of social life, social division, and so on and so on. In other words, one can almost say that, could almost say that one should turn the terms around here, that it's what Mar Marx calls Concrete labor, which is truly abstract, <coughs> in the sense that this is an abstraction. I directly work on an object to confer on it use value. <coughs> this is abstract view. This always happens within a certain social totality. And this totality is, belongs to the, is what value is about. So abstract <coughs> labor means, as Poston put it very nicely, that in other pre-capitalist formations, Dominate the relations of domination were directly enacted through interpersonal relations and were in this sense relatively independent from production. Like you can have a farmer, then 
there was the field lord took part of the project for him, then there was a war, a war, another feudal lord came, took the value of him, but the production went on, you know what I mean? The exploitation was assured through extra economic means. While in capitalism, it is there in economy, which is why the thing was there. Ah, you want now not me to tell the truth, no? <laughs> what I got, just to conclude, what I'm simply saying is that uh, in this way, we can see why Marx claims that the labor is the sole source of value. The point is not some primitive, primitive pseudo-medieval ontology where for some mystical reasons only value, uh, only human labor counts as the source of value. It concerns labor as a social phenomenon. This is why only labor, because labor, this is what is unique of capitalism, that again, social divisions, hierarchy are already there outside in the production process, which is why they can be subtracted from interpersonal relations, we can be free and so on and so on. And this, again, we need more than ever today. So without being able to do it, I think this is what we need more than ever today, just because look exactly in this moment when, and that was the point of my talk, when uh, ideological struggle is harsher than ever. Some naive leftists thought, too, oh, economic crisis, perfect. Now people will start to read Marx. They were enthusiastic to the kind of intellectual orgasm. I got emails from them. Do you know that the sense of Marx went five times up and so on? I said, nice, but do you also know how brutally the recent meltdown is already used to reassert the most brutal ideological legitimization? For example, a week ago, there was, uh, even less, there was a terrifying uh, co-ed piece in New York Times defending, you know, they have now this problem, what to do with General Motors, no? Let it go bankrupt or not. And it openly says, yes, we should think the unthinkable. See, the, the limits of what is thinkable are changing. And they say that it would help to make General Motors a smaller, leaner, meaner, more adapted to the market company, but then they cannot resist in the, towards the end of this short piece to show their true cards. They openly say the main game will be that if a company goes bankrupt, those who will manage it will have the right to, and they use explicitly these brutal words, immediately, unconditionally reject, invalidate all the deals with trade unions concerning uh, security and so on and so on. So the crisis is already used to, 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 to fire people. They want to break the last remainders of trade unions and so on and so on and so on. So my point is simply that now, more than ever, as in every moment of crisis, we need, we need intellectual work, we need struggle and so on. Because again, crisis, this we can learn from my ex-friend Ernesto Laclau. I agree with him that crisis means just the ruling hegemony has disintegrated. And the situation is open. And who knows who will win? We know that. Out of a crisis in Germany, there were stronger communists, but Hit uh, Hitler was even stronger, and so on and so on. Now the battle is going on. Will this economic meltdown be used just to, not only just to reassert capitalism, but to make it even more brutal, efficient, and so on, which I think in all probability it will happen? Or will we be able to make our point? Now we are needed more than ever. I'm sorry for this, that I didn't go more into theory, but as always, everything comes out with my books. I even don't know why you are so stupid to come here. <laughs> everything is in my books. Thank you very much. imposes brutal uh, anthropocentric, eurocentric notion of linear time. <laughs> in speak I fight all my life. <laughs> Who is speaking about totalitarianism? I don't speak about it, I, I practice it. it. I am. <laughs>